I present to you Mr. James Burton, the 2018 National Best Farmer. Just share a true story about how I transitioned from multinational corporate into farming. So uh, it's, it's going to be a true story hovering around why I, why I started, how I started, where I am now. The thing that I've learned that I wish to share, especially with young um, potential farmers or agripreneurs like you, and then where I want to be. Next one, please. So um, let me just start on the agricultural side, the farming side. Uh, I started, I got the interest in 2002 and started uh, my farming adventure with just three acres. But today we have more than a thousand acres. Well, I have more than a thousand acres. All right. It's made up of 400 acres of mangoes, 300 acres of teak, 150 acres of cashew, 100 acres of oil palm, 100 acres oranges, 30 acres cocoa. We have got maize, uh, some of which we use to feed our workers. Uh, and we've got beehives uh, from which we get honey. Next one, please. Then we have some livestock, 100 cows, goats, rabbits. We are into snail farming. Uh, we have uh, some aqua aquaculture, something around 10,000 tilapia and catfish. And then we, the farm is Global Gap certified, Meta certified. What it means is this, is this that if we can find a market anywhere in the world, then the farm is as good as any farm anywhere in the world to be able to export. Please go ahead. Okay, now where did I come from? I spent 32 years in British American Tobacco, uh, Coca-Cola. I did some work as Group Managing Director for Bayer Pharmaceutical. I spent about 12 years in Cadbury. I spent time in Kraft Foods and Heinz and then Mondelez International. Some of these companies were acquired or they were taken over, but the cultures kept changing. Please go ahead. So this is just to show a few milestones um, indicating exactly what I did. As I said, I started in 2002. At the time, I was Group Managing Director of British American Tobacco. I was running three French-speaking countries, Togo, Benin, Niger. That's when I started with three acres. But then I moved to Coca-Cola as a senior executive and I acquired 1,400 acres, all driven by the passion I had in agriculture. I mean, if you are a senior executive in Coca-Cola, then generally you live very good. They take very good care of you. But that did not dissuade me from, from the ambition. And then, a year later, uh, I set up a 300-acre teak farm. And the reason is that I realized there was serious deforestation. So for me, I wasn't just going to do any farm. We were going to plant trees on areas where trees had been chopped. The peak, at the peak of my corporate career, 2007 to 2015, when I was the MD for West Africa, um, basically, 22 countries, so head of businesses, the 22 countries were reporting to me for Kraft Foods, Mondelez, Heinz. It still did not take my interest from farming. And that is when I planted 200 acres of mangoes, 100 acres of cashew, 30 acres of cocoa. Then I retired from the corporate world. I retired in Cadbury in 2016. I still continued planting because I had the opportunity to expand. And then in 2018, um, thank God, I was, I was awarded as, as the overall national best farmer. This is just the beginning of a few uh, pictures that I love to share. Now, this was me 36, 37 years ago when I left Lagos. This was my first passport, but that was my copy. So in case you doubt that I was a corporate person, that was, that's, that's my corporate picture. I was smart, sharp, 
<laughs> okay, and if this is even this even has better swag, isn't it? <laughs> Real corporate, but can you go back to just the previous slide? So I put the this was glory. Managing director, people who open gates, they will bow and all of that, but that was just glory. Next one. So I said, this is power because this is what is giving me money. Okay? And, and I mean it. I run corporate at the top, but I never earn as much as I'm earning in agribusiness. And it's fulfillment because it's, I'm doing something that pleases me and sort of meets my passion. Why did I go into farming? I went in for profit, obviously. I wanted, I didn't want to struggle in my retirement. No matter how well Coca-Cola, Mondelez, and everybody was paying me, I knew I could struggle on Ghana's pension. So I decided to have a good stream of, um, of income. And in my college days in Legon, I did some farming, so I knew I could make money, even though it was tough. I wanted a comfortable re re retirement. I wanted to get close to nature. And then, importantly, I wanted to give something. I come from the Brun Ahafu region, Bruno East region, where there's some serious deprivation. There are children who would not have the chance to go to. So I just wanted to go back and give back. Next one. Okay, this is more like a collage of real pictures on the farm. We've got mangoes, we've got oranges, we've got cashew. We have maize. We don't buy maize. We feed our workers on organically grown maize. Um, we have some reforestation. That's a uh, plantain up there. Please go ahead. Okay, livestock. These are all live pictures from the farm. So we've got rabbits. We've got a few cows, about 100. Um, got some, we call them local beds about 800 of them. Three years ago, I started with about 70. Now, the number about 800. We don't cage them. They do free range. Uh, go back, please. Snow farming is down there, if, and then some sheep. Next one. This, if, if after everything I've been through, I run a farm like any other farm, then I'm, I'm a disappointment, isn't it? So I try to run the farm, not because I have so much money to put in, but I run a farm which is structured. Where well, I first of all started, because when I decided to go into farming, I said, look, in corporate multinational, we write business strategies, five year strategic plans, one year operational plans, tactical, we run, if I'm doing a farm, why can't I use the same approach? So it's a structured farm, we had a digital map there, and I'm able to track everything going on on the farm, even though I may not be there. All right? And all those colors are indicating where the various crops are. We have a sanitation area, even before the days of COVID. Housekeeping was very important. Uh, and sanitation. Uh, these are a few of the structures we have for the workers. And then the one down there is an irrigation pumping center because if you can afford it, climate change is real. So this year, it's quite a bad year for mangoes. Uh, we've got mango fruits. We've got fruits. People are surprised. But it's because we're prepared to take some risk and borrow money. If you, you put the right resources in, you get, you get, get something back. Next one. OK, gender equality. Every year, we employ a couple of ladies, and we give them equal opportunities. That's Ruth and Gifty, you know, graduates from University of Ghana and KNUST. Government trains women charter operators. All right, so we give we give opportunities to them. They plow like the men plow. In fact, the beauty of it is that they're both engineers, so they can bring down the tractor and fix them back. We give them the opportunity, just so that we have some gender balance. Next one. When I went to the land, children were studying under that tree. So I've asked that they, don't, they never cut that tree so that we can always throw back. <laughs> I was able to lobby government five, six years ago. And this classroom 
block, three classroom block with teachers, office has been built on my farm. So that, because the nearest school from my farm is about four kilometers. So from seven children under that tree, the moment we went, I said, let's go ahead, even though it's not finished. 90 children enrolled in a day. They may never have ever gone to school, but because of this investment we've put there, they have the chance to go to school and have a future. Next one. Every year we donate computers. About 15 rural communities surrounding the farm we want to touch them. So we give computers to them. You can't believe it. Some of these children have only seen pictures of computers. And, and, and on one occasion when we donated, it was so emotional. They queued to come and touch it. But they write the same DEC with every other child. All right? So we, we have decided that we impact education by giving a few computers every year to the children in some of these schools. I, I always say that, I noticed that during my international travel, Ghanaians are particularly, is it subservience or whatever? Even when Ghanaians have achieved, they say, it's not me, I've not achieved. We, we have achieved, we are successful, and we are happy to say it. So what is the reason behind it? It's because we run the farm like a business. In the corporate world, we plan, we do it, and we measure. It's the same thing we do there. So if there is no, no demand, for instance, we cannot foresee demand. We don't plant anything. Some of these things are the things which give agriculture a bad name. We failed, even in spite of all my background, I failed on citrus. We planted oranges because one day I was driving through Eastern region, I saw a beautiful orange farm, and I was tempted to set it up. We struggled to sell the oranges. This is where we failed on planning, and we're paying dearly for it. Otherwise, our snail farm is based on a proper plan, and we are making money. So lessons that we have to take into consideration. With this soil test, as I said, we've planted trees. We adopt appropriate technology. We started small, remember, Somebody will say, oh, but you were a big guy in the corporate world. I had colleagues who were flying to Dubai every vacation. I chose to go back to Brunahafu and employ that money. And I've invited 40 of them. Some of them are very senior executives. They came to the farm. They wanted to spend a day, but they spent three days on the farm. Okay? So it's about priorities and what you decide to do in life. And then the passion and the drive for quality is part of everything I achieved in the corporate world. My passion has always been in agriculture. And then we focus on people and community. Next one. Some of the learnings, landing for food and jobs, a few opportunities, we take advantage. So one learning is that you treat your community well and they will take care of you. I recall that last year there was bushfire threatening. I was in Accra doing a program. They called me and said, seven of the villages came and formed a chain, a human chain, and they killed the fire and protected the farm. It doesn't belong to them. It's because they realize that it impacts their life. So that's a learning. And then ultimately, quality is what sells. If you don't have the quality, ultimately you won't sell. Next one. What next? started plans to set up an agricultural tourism. KAUSD and UDS, pre-COVID, started field trips to the farm. KAUSD was going to bring a thousand students in a year to the farm to see actually 600, not a thousand, but UDS was going to add 400. And they started, and you could tell the excitement of the students. So we want to set it up properly. I believe that Tourism Authority has said there are tourists who come to Ghana and they want to see properly planned farm. They want to see a cocoa tree where they eat chocolates. That sector is not organized, so we are looking at that. We want to go organic, and then we want to start, we export mangoes to the European Union. So we want to start packing the mangoes online. 
And I've been doing a few of these things just to try to inspire people. So that's mentorship, and I want to continue doing that. Next one. Just a hint. I'm sure some of you know. The global population continues to grow. UN estimates that there are about 80 million people born every year. 5.7 billion, 1995. The population currently is estimated at 7.7 .7 billion. And UN thinks that in about 30 years, there will be about 10 billion human beings on this earth. They will all eat. So if you cannot see opportunities in agribusiness, then I don't know. Then there is the African free trade um, agreement, which is coming. Whether it's going to work or not, if it works, there are opportunities. A three trillion US dollar market is going to be opened up, even if it's a fraction of it. Why can't we position ourselves as farmers and take advantage? Next one. Okay, I just want to show this. I'm not going to comment. I've been talking about farming. But these are some of the agribusiness opportunities because what I'm doing here is also to try to inspire you. If you don't have the capacity to do a farm, you can do agribusiness and uh, what is that input? What uh, Mr. Abiyobo and his people, fertilizers and agrochemicals, it's a profitable area. That's a farm, you can process. And um, you can go into logistics, that's a retail. At the end of the day, you make money. Next one. In case you want to do farming, these are a few of the opportunities. I put the slide up because I've been able to get Ministry of Food and Agriculture to give me what they call crop budget. It shows what input you make and what return on investment you can make from 27 different crops. They have it. Unfortunately, they sit on such data. They don't share it. So I pushed them and they gave it to me. So I know why we are planting this and we are not planting this, okay? Tag data available. Next one. Okay. Um, just to tell you about something real. Um, two years ago, we made a million Ghana cities from our mango farm. And we spent only 27% on cost. Very profitable, isn't it? And this is just about 100 acres. The global demand for mangoes, for example, is over 90 billion US dollars. And Ghana sells less than 200 um, million US dollars a year. Next one. This is my last slide. You see, some years ago, when I left Legon, I didn't even have a bicycle, OK? So I was doing the natural way, by foot. But I dreamt that one day I have a Mercedes. It was a big dream. But because I had a dream, I started working towards it. Thank God, by the grace of God, I drive something which is slightly better than this. Okay? So it is possible. Thank you very much, and I hope I've inspired somebody. Thank you very much. Wow, a big round of applause. And that is why my work gets very difficult. Just three questions. The rest of them, you can write them. We'll email it to Mr. James Watson, and I know he would take time to answer everyone. Three hands, three questions. I see four hands. What do I do? Ladies first. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm as you know, I'm doing University of Cape Coast. I'd want to say I admire you, sir, for moving out of the corporate world and to be a farmer and giving back to society. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, please, I want to know if your farm is open to take people like us to do national service and then hopefully teach us a thing or two. Because a couple of us are interested in um, juicing fruits. And since your farm is into fruits, I don't know if that is possible. Thank you. Okay, let me take one from here. I'm David Andomadeonline.com. Uh, Mr. James Watson, I'm very happy to see you here today. You actually look like a Western farmer. <laughs> this is 
how I see you. Please, I want to tell us uh, at uh, what stage did you uh, decide to invest heavily in the agri business? And I, I also want you to tell us, uh, looking at uh, how you worked with some of these um, prestigious companies, those, uh, let's say the student here, I, I, I think it's not everybody who will have this uh, opportunity to excel too much in the agricultural sector. What advice will you give them? Because if you don't have uh, the capacity to work with companies you mentioned, it will be difficult for you to start something, but you pass through, you did a lot. So those who did not or who may not have this kind of uh, opportunity, what advice will you give them? Okay, so let me add that third question. Thank you very much, sir, for the motivation. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, in your region, in the Bono region, I'm sure there are local farmers in the region who do not even have access to education. They might not even have a business plan or they are not even running the system you are running. Uh, how do you suggest or how do you think that we, the youth, can also help these farmers in trying to take advantage of the African Free Trade Continental Agreement? Okay. Uh, let me start from your, your, your question. Um, yes, as I said, we have to take, we have to crawl before we start running. So, I think there are some fundamentals of agriculture that the rural people lack. In fact, sometimes they do not even have the capacity to know how much fertilizer they even put on their trees. But in an attempt to fertilize, they end up probably you know, hurting their plants. So there are basic things that need to be done. I know that government uh, extension services people try to help, but um, if I have to be very specific, we, 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 there are very basic things we do. If you have a, a three-acre farm, you don't need a strategic business plan. You'll be killing a mosquito with a, a sledgehammer, so you don't need that. But at least ask yourself, why do I want to grow maize and not, and not granules? What happens today is that when maize prices go up, a lot of farmers will rush in because Presbyterian next door has made money. And then there's a glut. And then because the buffer stock company system is not working as expected, prices drop. The visual cycle is still there. So there are basic things that we try to do by doing some advocacy work. And uh, given the position uh, that I held uh, in 2018, gives me some access towards policy people who look. They don't need all the big things. There are basic things that the average farmer needs. And we're trying our best working with the local ministry of agri people to try to impact them. The next question was, um, I mean, obviously it's not everybody who will get a chance to do so well in the corporate world. But what I noticed was that the moment I started the three acre farm, because I was focused on it, my mind was on it, and that's why I didn't waste resources. I've been advocating to government that Youth in agri, youth in agri. Why can't we have a policy where we have, say, agricultural ambassadors in every rural location, or people like you, you are made ambassadors and you are sponsored to demonstrate why agriculture is good by giving you some minimal funding. If government drives it with the support of some NGOs, those will work. But in all of this, you must demonstrate the interest as an individual. The next one, uh, at what stage that I decided to invest in agriculture, I decided, I think the, the, really rev the, the big revelation came when I was on a trip, a uh, corporate trip to South Africa. And then when I finished that, I took vacation and stayed on in South Africa for about a week. And that's when I realized that if you run a farm as a business, you make a lot of money. And that's when really my mindset, mindset changed. All right, 
I think um, there was a first question. National service, yes, it's open. But uh, there are a few preconditions. You must be prepared to stay on the farm. There's solar lighting and a little bit of entertainment. We got good, good accommodation and uh, and all of that. But we want people who are pragmatic, like every young farmer who are prepared to work there. So uh, I'm sure that Agri House can share my contact later. If you talk to me, yes, you have the opportunity. As many people as we can accommodate, we'll give you the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Jim Gorton.